Good morning, friends, and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is indeed a day for us, all of us together, friends, God's people at worship, to fall back. And not just in that blessed extra hour of rest last night, but falling back upon our memories of the faith and life of all who have gone before on this All Saints Day worship. To fall back on the gift of our faith, faith in the eternal presence of the God who loves us and who is always with us. To fall back into the arms of loved ones, those who are still with us, who through a Beatitudes way of life may know the true joy of living as children of God. Friends, today we fall back into the arms of God, into the presence of brothers and sisters in Christ, into the gifts of bread and cup, into the gift of a table set for us that welcomes all of us, no matter who we are or where we have been, to know that there is a place for us in the family of God, a place of love, of welcome, and of rest. Friends, on behalf of the people and the ministry of the Old First Presbyterian Church in Huntington, New York, I welcome you into this time of worship. May this be a time where the gift of our memories of those who have gone before is filled with the comfort of knowing they are with our God, even as we are filled with the joy of knowing that God is with us now as we worship together in spirit, and in truth. Friends, I invite us to join together in this morning's call to worship taken from the 36th Psalm. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the clouds. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! All people may take refuge in your arms. Continue your steadfast love to all who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Friends, secure in the sheltering embrace of God's unconditional love, I invite us to lift our hearts and our voices together in joyful and joy-filled worship as together we share our opening hymn, For All the Saints.
friends, today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 12. A portion of the Sermon on the Mount that is referred to as the Beatitudes. Friends, I invite us to hear in these familiar words a new reminder of God's word for us today. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, friends, I invite our young disciples to gather closer to their screens as we share a special time together. Good morning to all of our wonderful young disciples. I am so glad that you are all able to be here worshiping together this morning. As you've heard me mention already this morning, friends, today is a special day in the life of the church, a day we call All Saints Day. Today is a day for us to remember those who have gone before us and are now with God in heaven. And I want to talk to you this morning, friends, about something called memory. In fact, I want to test your memory this morning. So for all of our young disciples, and for all of our young disciples at heart, that's all of you adults worshiping together today, I want you to take a special look at your screen right now and tell me what you see. Now, as you can see, friends, there are some images on your screen. There is an apple, a zebra, a car, a football, a house, and some sneakers. Now, if I were to ask you to close your eyes, and just in case you try to peek, I'm going to go ahead and take those images away. And now, friends, can you remember what you saw? Does anybody remember any of those items? Excellent. Just as a refresher, here they are again. How many of us remembered the apple or the car or the zebra or the house or the football or the sneakers? Friends, when we closed our eyes or when the screen went blank, I'm sure there are many of us that remembered all of those items, but I will bet that everybody remembered at least one. And friends, the same is true when we lose people that we love and care for in our lives. We have very special memories of those people that stay with us always. So that when we close our eyes and we think about them, we remember their voice or their face 
We remember the things that we loved about them. We remember the special way that they made us feel. Those feelings come back. Because even though those people are gone from our lives, they are still a part of who we are in our memory and in the way we choose to live our lives and love others. So friends, I want you to think about that this week. Those people in your lives that you can't see every day because they are not with us physically anymore, but that they are still part of our hearts and our lives through the memories we have of our time with them and the lessons of love they taught us that we are blessed to remember, to live, and to share every day of our lives. Friends, will you bow with me in prayer and repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of our memory. Help us to remember all of our loved ones who are no longer with us, but who live on in our hearts, in our lives, and in our memory. In Jesus' name we pray. As together, all of us say with one another, Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Friends, I believe that one of the greatest mistakes people make when reading, studying, and yes, even preaching the Beatitudes is equating a Beatitude way of living with weakness or passivity, especially for us as 21st century hearers. And while we could talk about how this principle applies to each and every one of the Beatitudes in great length and with exhaustive detail, there is one in particular, friends, that seems to leap from the pages of Scripture for such a time as this. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children. Of God. Children of God, friends, may just be the greatest title for which we as a people of faith may strive for in our lives. This opportunity, this chance to be called a people of God who are called God's own children, grafted into God's own family, made heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ, may be the single greatest gift for which we strive for in the life of faith. Children of God. And friends, all we have to do is live as peacemakers. But rest assured, friends, that there is nothing passive about this particular call to action that Jesus makes. 
To live as peacemakers in this life is not an easy task. In fact, it requires great effort on our part. It requires many godly characteristics all coming together, working together, all those other beatitudes, being poor in spirit, mourning over sin and suffering in this world. Being meek, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, showing mercy and being pure of heart. All of these holy and precious gifts come together, friends, as God's people, as you and me devote our lives to actively living as makers of peace. In short, friends, the ability to live as peacemakers in this world is a summary of every other one of the Beatitudes. When we internalize all of these qualities and characteristics, we become true peacemakers. And perhaps the greatest gift in the life of faith is ours. The chance to be called children of of God. Friends, in that visual representation that began today's message, I was struck powerfully by one particular series of images. It began with those two women, one black and one white, walking hand in hand as the words were spoken, blessed are the peacemakers. And then came that stunning image of God's people lying together in peace and rest as children of God. This, friends, is what our world needs more of. Especially as we face the chaos and uncertainty of times that feel more unsteady with each new day. But friends, in our desire to see those images become clearer in this life, may we avoid the mistake that far too many have made before us, that living as peacemakers is somehow passive. That simply avoiding conflict is enough. Because that's not what Jesus means as He shares these words. Living as peacemakers is not simply about avoiding conflict. No, friends, living as makers of peace is about actively working for the good of others. One of my absolute favorite observations about peace of all time was written in the mid-90s by Jonathan Larson in the musical Rent. As one of the characters leaps to the top of a table singing La Vie Boheme and declares that the opposite of war isn't peace, it's creation. Now, listen carefully to that, friends, because it is subtle yet powerful. That the opposite of war is not peace, but creation. Living as peacemakers, living as children of God is not about the absence of conflict or ending the wars between people or passively embracing some can't we all just get along mindset, but rather about the active pursuit, the deliberate creation of time and space to allow yourself and even more importantly, friends, to empower others to thrive, to grow, to be nurtured, to create new things. This is what it means for God's people to be peacemakers. Not waiting passively in the hopes that conflict will magically cease, but actively seeking peace, actively avoiding the evils that threaten our peace. Those divisive words that pull God's people apart. Those divisive actions that leave people feeling isolated and alone. Those divisive posts, comments, and status updates that fill our digital lives with conflict. Being peacemakers requires sacrifice of self. 
Being willing to suffer wrongs, to avoid conflict, to remove those sources of conflict, to resist the instinct to judge and condemn others, especially when we are guilty of the same sins we are accusing them of in our lives. It means being fully aware of the power of our words and deeds, knowing that a gentle word can diffuse a situation and an angry word can escalate trouble. Friends, being a peacemaker means being willing to forgive others and to receive forgiveness. It means taking all those other beatitude ways of living and devoting our lives to each and every one, even if it means being persecuted for righteousness, having people utter evil against us falsely simply for the sake of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, nobody said it was easy, but it certainly does not come without great reward the most life-changing title that any one of us may ever know, friends, is a child of God. And friends, if that is what we desire in our lives, then today is the day. Let us begin today, commit tomorrow, and then continue with each and every day that follows to not passively but actively live as makers of of peace. For only in this, friends, may we know the true and everlasting joy of life as a child of God. Thanks be to our God, as together God's people say, Amen. Friends, as we move together into a time of sitting together at table and celebrating the gifts of bread and cup, we are mindful of that moment in our communion when we proclaim that we join with the faithful of every time and every place who forever sing to the glory of God's name. This brings to mind and to heart all of those who have gone before us to God's eternal kingdom. And friends, in Christ, each one of us have individuals whom we remember in these moments. Those people in our lives who have lived in ways that make Christ real for us and whose memory is with us every time we gather together. 
Friends, this year, perhaps more than any other, it has been a season that has overwhelmed us. We have been overwhelmed by the chaos in our world. Overwhelmed by separation. Overwhelmed by a virus. Overwhelmed by issues of justice and equality. But friends, let us not in these moments be overwhelmed by those feelings. Instead, friends, let us be overwhelmed by the assurance that God is always with us. That in these reminders of bread and cup, we are present with the God who honors our loss, but who ultimately brings us hope. Friends, celebrating those truths, we welcome into our time of worship our friend, Dr. Marsha McPhee, to lead us in a litany of loss and hope. We gather, friends, mindful of the losses that have multiplied throughout this year. As we look back at this year all at once, we're in danger of being overwhelmed by its tragedies. Sickness, violence, fire, hurricane, flood, earthquake, and more. Our aim in this moment is to simply acknowledge it, to mourn it, and to know that in all of this, there's the possibility of more light. If we are to be overwhelmed, let it be that we are overwhelmed with the assurance that we are not alone. And so we will light four candles for prayer for loss, and a fifth candle of hope. Please join me in a litany of losses. Your lines will be prompted. We mourn the loss of life. For so many, the pandemic has taken loved ones. We mourn the loss of those close to us and those whose names we do not know. We mourn those who perished while working to save other lives. We mourn those who died, not of pandemic, but of other causes. And we mourn the loss, in many cases, of our ability to be with them as they passed. Our loss of gathering together for comfort in the ways that we needed so much. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn this loss of life. We honor and remember these beloveds. We pray for comfort and peace. We pray for comfort and peace. Amen. Amen. We mourn the loss of livelihoods. For so many, the pandemic has taken the security of food, shelter, care for families and medical care. We mourn the loss of businesses that could not withstand the circumstances. These were not just businesses, but dreams born of passion and hard work. We mourn those who find themselves needing to rely on others for help, when what they really want to do is to be able to help others. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn this loss of livelihood. We honor and remember the dreams now deferred. We honor and remember the dreams now deferred. We pray for sustenance and resilience. We pray for sustenance and resilience. Amen. Amen. We mourn the loss of love. Our society's dilemma, centuries in the making, has created such hatred, suffering, oppression, and ill will. We mourn the loss of those whose lives were lost to brutality and violence. We mourn the loss of our ability to love one another despite our differences, as beings who deserve to be seen for the inherent beauty and worth, each one a part of the beloved community. We mourn that black and brown people have perished and suffered at greater proportion in the pandemic of coronavirus. We mourn the pandemic of racism that still plagues the fabric of our communities. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn the loss of love. We mourn the loss of love. 
We honor and remember the work of prophets who proclaim justice. We honor and remember the work of prophets who proclaim justice. We pray for compassion and change. We pray for compassion and change. Amen. We mourn the loss of liveliness. For so many, this year has robbed us of our energy, our enthusiasm, and our sense of well-being. We mourn teachers and leaders and caregivers and workers who are struggling to help those in their care, themselves exhausted and needing the sustenance that they give to others. We mourn the loss of all who are suffering with anxiety and depression, who are finding it difficult to live each day with fullness or to find hope for tomorrow. We mourn those we have lost to suicide. We mourn those who find themselves addicted to substances in order to ease the pain that feels unbearable. We mourn those who are experiencing their places of shelter as an abusive place from which they struggle to escape. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn the loss of liveliness. We mourn this loss of liveliness. We honor and remember that each person is precious and whole. We honor and remember that each person is precious and whole. We pray for recovery and renewed vigor. We pray for recovery and renewed vigor. Amen. Amen. And now we light the fifth candle just as we will do this year on Christmas Eve. We light this as a sign of our belief. We believe in the light that has come and is coming. This light casts its glow on all the surrounding prayers that we have prayed. This light resides within us and perhaps dim for a time, but always lit an ember of the holy inside of us. This light reminds us that we are not alone. Christ is with us. Amen. Friends, the light of Christ burns among us. This hopeful and hope-filled promise of the Christ who has come and is coming yet again. Friends, this is the Lord's table and our Savior invites all those who trust and believe in Him to join in this joyful and joy-filled feast so that together we may run the race that has been set before us laying aside the heavy burdens of sin and death, and following the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Friends, let us gather together around our tables, rejoicing in the great cloud of witnesses that joins with us as we give thanks to God, saying, The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Friends, let us bow together in prayer. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you our thanks and praise, O Lord our God. We praise you for the saints and martyrs, the faithful of every time and every place who have followed your Son and witnessed to his resurrection. From every race and every tongue, from every people and every nation, you have gathered us together into your kingdom. You have shown them the path of life and filled them with the joy of your presence. How glorious is your heavenly kingdom! where the multitude of saints rejoice with Christ. Remembering that we are not alone at this table, we join our voices with all the saints whom you have called, from all times and from all places, who forever sing the glory of your praise. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give you thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ, our host and our guest at this table. Through his birth, you took on flesh, affirming the goodness of our bodies and our world. Through his life, you took on suffering, sharing the truth of hope and desperation. Through his death, you took on death itself, revealing the depth of your love for us. And through his resurrection, you brought new creation, embodying the promise of life everlasting. Friends, each time we gather at this table, we remember that moment when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gathered with his disciples, took the bread, blessed it, and gave thanks to God, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat from it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, our Lord took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink from it, do so also in remembrance of me. Friends, each time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the truth that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are called to be makers of peace, children of God, for these are the gifts of God for all of us together, friends, the people of God. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup, that we may taste your goodness, see your presence, and become one with you. Gather us around your table, your table where we rejoice with all your saints who have gone before us. We remember them now as together we speak their names, the names of those who are with us always as our great cloud of witnesses. Jennifer Lynn Baptista, Louis, Holly, and their extended family love and miss her more than words can say. Quentin Samus, beloved husband of Marge Samus. Fiona Green, younger sister of Charles Warledge, a woman of tremendous faith who gave her family the utmost love and support. Dr. Gordon Harris, George West, father of Deborah Panagakis and grandfather to Gus. Gloria and Walter Nass, Walter Nass Jr., Chick Nass, Cynthia Nass, and Linda Young, always in our prayers. Edward and Betty Burgess, we miss you every day. Robert Matthew, Palmer Means, and Margaret Means. Margaret and Frederick Meyer, parents of Leslie Yovino, who she still thinks about and misses each and every day. Paul and Regina Consulman, Mary Jane and Mary Regina Tibbetts. Joe Green, brother of Virginia Green, whose greatest joys were his family, listening to baseball on the radio, and who had a great penchant for statistics. Dr. Stan and Ethel Dransfield, former pastor of Old First Church. Edward J. Williams and Paul E. Williams. Reverend Frederick and Alice Bosch.
Friends, in Christ, the bread has been broken, the cup has been poured. The body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Together, let us take, eat, drink, and remember. Friends in Christ, as we prepare to go out from this place, both together in spirit, but also separate in where we find ourselves worshiping today. Friends, we know that we are living in extremely challenging times. And friends, those times do not get any easier as we go out into the world this week and face the uncertainty of a presidential election an election with great emotion and great rhetoric on both sides of the aisle. Friends, recognizing the anxiety that this causes for so many of God's people, I invite us to hear together this special message. A message that reminds us of no matter what chaos rages around us in November, God is still God. These are challenging times. The division and frustration are palpable. The balance is constantly shifting. The lines consistently blurred. Truths, half-truths, lies, mixed messages, confusing headlines, all in the middle of a nation whose back has been broken. Hope is drowned out by fear. Peace is muted by chaos. Dreams are crushed by reality. Finding God in the midst of this moment is difficult. As the election draws closer, countless voices will try to sway you one way or the other. Yet your responsibility is simple. Pray earnestly. Seek God passionately. Listen carefully and vote how he leads you. God is sovereign. He always has been. He is faithful. He always will be. And nothing, absolutely nothing happens outside of his providence. This is where we find peace in this moment. Friends, as we prepare to go out into the world, a world filled with great chaos and confusion, a world that feels more divisive each day, may we go as God's people praying earnestly, seeking God passionately, listening carefully, and most of all, friends, living as active peacemakers. Not just passively hoping for the best, but actively working and living in ways that draw God's people closer together so that whatever happens in our world, we may trust and know that God is God, that God is sovereign, that God is present among us, that we may fall back into the greatest truth. And that is that we are children of God. 
Friends, once again, remembering all those who have gone before, for all the high and holy ones who have done great wonders and lived as shining lights in the world, we give God our thanks. For all the meek and lowly ones who have earnestly sought God in the darkness, held fast to their faith in times of trial, and done good as they have had the opportunity, we give God our thanks. We especially give thanks for those whom we have known and loved, who by their patient obedience and self-denial, whose steadfast hope and helpfulness in times of trouble have shown the same mind that was in Christ Jesus our Lord, as they have comforted and upheld our souls. Grant us grace to follow in their footsteps, at last sharing with them in the inheritance of the saints in light, living as peacemakers so that we may be children of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now, friends, may we go. Wherever we go, knowing that we may always fall back into the arms of God who is present always. The God who assures us that we are never alone, but uplifted by the love of God, nourished by the life of Jesus Christ, and inspired by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore, as together God's people say, Amen.